Hey everybody, I'm the Bat Otter, and I still have a blister on my tongue. So, if I sound like an idiot uh, while I'm reviewing, that's why. Nothing to do with anything else. Uh, so, this is the, what is this, like the fifth volume? That's what the number five stands for, right? A Berserk. And I've been sitting thinking, hey, I could review every single volume of Berserk and have, like, what, a hundred videos on the channel? Ow. <laughs> but... I could also instead make a total joke of all the reviews and have fun with it and skip over parts and not tell anybody. So I think I'm going to do that from here on out. Because uh, there's so much to Berserk. <laughs> and honestly, who needs to review that much stuff? Uh, who knows, right? I'll skip around, jump around, do whatever I want to do when I want to do it. Just have fun, right? That's what it's all about. Uh, so... Uh, they just went on a raid, Guts got in trouble, and Griffith had to save him. And then everybody's like, oh man, Guts, you're really cool. Because he's really cool. And uh, this guy, Pippin. Uh, we, we get introduced to a lot of the characters for the Golden Age arc leading into the Eclipse. In, of course, the Golden Age arc. And, you know, there's there's not much to say that I haven't said already. Uh, Miura's ability to get you to understand and know a character very well in only a handful of pages, it, it never goes away. Uh, and it, I think it's very much showcased in the Golden Age arc in particular, because you immediately know how Pippin acts. And Pippin, he's a great guy. Uh, you immediately know how Judo acts. Uh, he's more thoughtful. He is uh, more crafty than the other guys. He's smaller, right? Pippin, he's big. He's happy to be there. Uh, he enjoys what he does. And uh, you see Casca and how she has a little bit of an admiration and an idolization of Griffith. And how she takes her position very seriously in the Band of the Hawks. And obviously goes at odds with Guts because he doesn't take it so serious. Uh, of course we get some more uh, nice panels of everybody interacting, having very human interactions, uh, acting very naturally in their environment. Guts and Griffith go for naked wrestling um, while they're wet, uh, and we get introduced to the Behalit, right? He doesn't know what it is. He sees it as a good luck charm. Us, the reader, we read the manga. We're smarter than these guys. We know where this is going. Uh, and so the Behalit serves as kind of a a plot device throughout the story where it saves people and it clearly has some divine properties uh, and so even knowing what it is later it's still very ominous in 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 the course of the story uh, what else do we got uh, yeah so we get another person saying the same thing about Guts' sword that it's really big and girthy and uh, yeah you know uh, as it is uh, some more battle scenes. I'll touch on the battle scenes much later in the series. Uh, not much later. Probably in the next volume. Uh, because it's much better to get my point across with those battle scenes. But we immediately understand who Guts is as a character. He rushes into battle. He likes killing. He's really good at it. They put him at the forefront as a battering ram into the enemies. And they charge in after him. Because that's what he works best at, right? That causes conflict inside the circle. Casca gets upset with him a lot for putting them in danger. But they're starting to win the good graces of a king. Uh, in their success on the battlefield. They're undisputed, undefeated champions of the world. Well, they're raiding a castle. And everybody's talking. And we get introduced to our first apostle. Nostra Tuzad. Uh, and they're all discussing him. And again, I, I could go over panel by panel, uh, how interesting and how perfectly executed everything is, but, uh, just read it for yourself. <laughs> go to your library, ow, ow, I had to cut that, uh, go to your library, read it, you know, don't be lazy, <laughs> uh, but I like this interaction here specifically, where it's like, oh, they're being held off by one man, and it's like, Zod, who's Zod, and, uh, of course, Judo, uh, Mr. Exposition starts telling us about Zod. Oh my gosh, 
the legendary King Zod, and you get this real ominous look of him. And of course, at this point, knowing Guts, and this is what makes me like the series so much, is how it's very predictable, but it's also very good. Like I said, it, it takes a lot of tropes that you see in most media, and it doesn't flip it on your head. It doesn't subvert the expectations. It does. It just does it very well. So, of course, the second that they hear about one guy being able to hold off an entire army, there's this ominous shot of them looking over the castle, and they're like, oh, Guts is going to go right in. And he's like, what? <laughs> Freaking out about it. Uh, he's like, you stop me, I'll try to kill you. Uh, as he would, he sees his man come out of there, and when everybody sees what is happening inside that cave, uh, they let Guts go in. And, of course, we see another excellent panel of carnage, right? But as Guts fights Zod, we get some... I wouldn't say foreshadowing, but the thing about Berserk is it's very uh, Chekhov's gun, and that's a literary term, I believe, uh, from a Russian playwright. Um, and in that sense, let me explain it, uh, everything that you see has an impact on the story. So something 20 chapters ago is brought up here. I'll, uh, in the later 100-man battle, there's another point that I'll show you guys. Uh, but here, Guts is overwhelmed and in absolute terror of this apostle the first time he sees him. And if you remember Guts' dream about Donovan, it's kind of the same idea there. It's a very overwhelming, overpowering force causing Guts to completely freeze up and uncharacteristically show a lot of fear and a lot of uh, hesitance to engage in battle despite the fact that he's very much headfirst into battle. So he gets into a scrap with uh, this big guy, the Band of the Hawk come to save him, Griffith comes to save him, we get some more excellent panels, uh, they do the pincer maneuver from Jojo and uh, almost beat him but then Guts get, I mean Griffith gets tail whipped, uh, this pony boy starts talking about uh, death that you can never escape, prophesizing to Guts and flies away, everybody's safe and sound. But, of course, Guts doesn't let this down. He is suspicious of Griffith from the very beginning, uh, but having all these little hints dropped at him that something is going to go very wrong in their relationship and the, the, the soldiers on the battlefield, he gets those dropped out with the hints of the apostles through the bailet. And uh, things like that never leave his head. So that's pretty much how this section ends. It ends with Griffith and Guts having a heart-to-heart. -heart. A very, again, uh, I should say natural conversation. Uh, one of the things that Araki wrote in manga and theory and practice is that he never writes his characters. He, as he would put it, hurls his protagonist into peril. And he lets the characters act. And that's how he describes his writing process. And in my opinion, it, it seems very much like that's what Miura did with Berserk, the way that he likes his characters act, because it all seems so natural. The dialogue, the interactions, the expressions on their face, there's a lot of good acting involved. And of course, it's uh, complemented by very uh, self-aware illustrations in the panels, where it's all so thoughtful. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, all around good. Continues. Uh, turns out there's a conspiracy to take out Griffith before he rises too high to power. So we get one of those moments where Griffith can look so happy since he's flirting with the king's daughter. Uh, as he's trying to get assassinated, Griffith figures out that it was uh, Prince Charles that tried to take him out. And so he calls Guts up to his study, and we see a little bit into Griffith's more personal calculating life, uh, like we haven't seen yet. He looks very formal, he looks very proper. Books, books, books everywhere, studying while everybody's out partying. And he says, I'd like you to kill a man for me. And again, there's a lot of contrast in the series, so Miura, in that theme, draws Griffith very innocently and very 
unsuspecting whenever he says things like, I'd like you to kill a man for me. And Guts is very shocked by that statement. He's like, I've killed plenty of people before, but, and again, this is a very uh, subtle expression, right? That you don't see in, with a lot of artists uh, where it, he's expressing many things at once, a little bit of hesitance, confusion, uh, and like, what's going on here but you don't really see expressions like this out of many characters very often because again it's a very subtle unique expression uh so he says why don't you just order me to do it like always almost like he's a little bit scared by the premise uh so prince charles is fighting with his kid uh gut sneaks into the study and kills him unfortunately the kid finds guts and on instinct guts goes to kill the kid not realizing it's a kid, and we finally find out why Guts likes kids, because he sees this kid that he just killed, and he thinks, hey, I was a kid one time. That's why. <laughs> That's why Guts has the things for kids, because he too was a kid. Ain't that profound. Um, <laughs> oh man, I told you guys, I'm just having fun with this now. So the kid dies, Guts ends up chopping up a bunch of soldiers uh, with that funny robe on. Uh, but he gets into, he gets in pretty in over his head, uh, comes to meet the gang all tattered up, swimming around in uh, doo-doo water. He goes to confront Griffith, v looking very beaten up. He's obviously traumatized by the experience because once again, he too was a kid. Uh, and Griffith goes on this really long speech about, that's very important for the story going forward that I'm going to skip over. Where he says, a man can dream, can't he? And a man who dreams is my equal. So, Guts hears that, and let's see where the panel is. You see a little bit of evil Griffith whenever it turns out uh, the guy's been killed. Where is it? Where's the panel? Hold on. Here it is. Uh, what I think a friend is, is one who is my equal. And that statement drives the story in its entirety basically for the rest of the golden age arc and everything that falls apart before the eclipse is driven by this single statement that guts overheard unbeknownst to griffith you could say if this statement was never made or heard the rest of the story might not have happened the way it did so that's a very impactful statement uh and it's drawn in a very impactful way where the entire time Guts is looking up the stairs to Griffith as is Casca, and Casca is slowly realizing that her dreams with Griffith are completely, completely over. Uh, so they're both looking up to him, but in a different light, and it just carries throughout the story that Guts wants to be Griffith's friend, he wants to be his equal, and so you get this isolated scene of Griffith glowing, but Guts being almost faded in the background, uh, quite literally looking up to him. I mean, you can be more uh, on the nose with some of these things, but again, they're done very well, very eloquently. So, um, the queen doesn't like that her daughter's flirting with a peasant boy. Uh, Casca's on her period and gets her butt whooped by this fellow we'll see a lot later. Guts comes in to defend her. Uh, Casca falls off a cliff. Uh... And talks to Guts. Guts, Guts. Oh, let's cut over that, shall we? Um, and when I first saw this, the first thing I thought was, oh, because this is one of the many times that Guts is going to save somebody from falling off a cliff, but this foreshadows some stuff later. But if you guys remember in the end of the last, the first uh, volume, he saves that little girl from falling with his sword, and he's very emotionally impacted after the fact, and... Uh, we'll find out, I think, in the next one, again, why. So, like I said, lots of revelations, lots of things to be revealed. We get some Costco backstory. She was going to be uh, assaulted by some guy, and then Griffith comes and saves her. And she goes with Griffith, and uh, it's this very nice emotional scene where she sees Griffith as... What does she see him as? As like a god, basically. Many of them do. It's his charisma. Kind of like Hitler. Uh, Griffith is a lot like Hitler. I'd say more like Satan, but you could make the 
comparison to Hitler as well. Because <laughs> uh, they were both known for their charisma. So that, that's, that's the volume. Uh, like I said, I might... I'll probably take it easy on these. Uh, skip over. You know, I'll skim through them before I do so that way I can talk about some stuff. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe. Check out my Instagram and Twitter in the description. That's where I post all my artwork. If you're in South Texas, you might see me around at art markets. Uh, and also check out my live streams whenever they're happening. They're not going to happen consistently, but hey, check them out anyway. I'll have some more reviews up later. Thank you guys for watching.